thank you everyone and welcome to the second in this three-part judicial review defending the focused webinar today's seminar as hopefully most of you will know is on what happens between issuing a claim and getting a permission decision um, a slight flag up we've got the third part in the series coming up on the 12th of july where we're going to be looking at what happens uh, post permission but preparing for a contested trial and for those of you who haven't seen it yet we had uh, a webinar we did in may that's online now about what happens pre-issue and good public law decision making today's session is going to follow the same format as the last time so questions and, and answers uh, will be dealt with at the end of the talk questions are very much welcome but please do put them in the q a box the PowerPoint will be emailed out after the event. Um, and all that's left ready for me to do is to introduce the speakers. Um, those of you who were here last time will know me, I'm Matthew Wyard, I'm a barrister at 3PB, specialising in public law. And I am delighted to be joined today by my colleague, Charlotte Hadfield, who you should be able to see on your screen. Hi, everyone. Charlotte's the deputy head of the public law team at 3PB, and she's the head of the education law team. Some might say she's therefore quite busy, so I'm extremely grateful to her for being here. Um, she has real expertise in bringing and defending judicial review claims, particularly in the education context. Evidence of that you can see from the number of reported cases she's been involved in. Um, as recently as last week, there was the Swale Clip Park School and Wokingham Council case. And she's also been involved in DJing the Welsh Ministers, DS Northampton, not, uh, Nottinghamshire County Council and SF to, to name but a few. Um, so we're we're all in good hands today. In terms of the agenda for the talk, I'm going to deal with the first half of it. We'll discuss analysing receipt of a judicial review claim and preparing the AOS and the summary grounds of resistance. And I'll briefly touch on defendant directions as well. Charlotte's then going to take over and deal with urgent consideration and give you all a, a lowdown in the types of permission decisions that can be made in a judicial review claim and uh, analysis of adverse decisions. We'll try to finish uh, about 10 to 12, quarter to 12, so we've got time for Q&A. With that being said, on to section number one, which is preparing the acknowledgement of service, summary grounds of resistance, and seeking directions. <clears throat> so, as defendant advisers, the first time, if you've not been involved in the pre-action stage, that you will become aware that a claim has been issued is when your client frantically comes to you and says that they've been served with a claim. At which point, the first thing I would suggest you need to do as advisers is check what your client has actually received one, to make sure it is actually a claim for judicial review, and secondly, to see what documents are there. So what should you have received? Well, there should be the claim form and statements of fact and ground as a, as a bare minimum. Um, sometimes the statement of facts and ground is included in the claim form, but more often than not, as I'm sure most of you are aware, it's a separate form that's drafted by counsel. There should be, in theory, quite a copious amount of evidence that's been filed as well. The emphasis on the claimant is to file all of the evidence that they wish to rely on when they issue their claim. So you should be getting that evidence when you receive the claim. Check if there are any applications for urgent consideration or interim relief, because the reality is they're going to be the first things that you need to deal with if there are. You'll know if there's an application for urgent consideration because you'll have a form N463 in the pack that you receive. And Charlotte will tell you more about that later. The other form that you want to look out for is a form called a Notice 1. It's one sheet of paper and it's the form that you should be being provided by a claimant if they have legal aid. If it is there, then what you want to do is check because on the form it should outline what the scope of the grant of legal aid is that the claimant has been given. Um, it's very rare, but I do know of at least one occasion um, where a friend of mine uh, proceeded with a claim without the right scope of legal aid, um, and it, it obviously caused him, as a claimant lawyer, nightmares. 
Um, but from a defendant perspective, if the claimant doesn't have the right scope of legal aid, then it can make your life interesting from a cost perspective. Now, anyone served with an application for judicial review who wants to take part needs to file, uh, or at least take part in the permission stage, needs to file an acknowledgement of service. That's on form N462. And if you want to contest the claim, then you need to include summary grounds of resistance alongside it. There is some space on the form to put summary grounds of resistance, but generally, review is taken that it's better put as a separate document. And the acknowledgement of service and your summary grounds must be filed no later than 21 days after service as a claim form. Exception to that is obviously if the court tells you you need to file it more quickly. Why should we file it? <clears throat> well, CPR 54.9 is quite clear on what a failure to file an acknowledgement of service means. It means that as a defendant, you don't get to take part in the permission stage of the process. So the court won't have your representations before it when it considers permission. Equally, if there's a permission hearing, you won't be allowed to take part. Now, that's not to say that as a defendant, if you don't file an AOS, you can't take part in the, in the trial or uh, steps after permission. You can, as long as you file de detailed grounds of resistance post permission and we'll deal with detailed grounds of resistance in preparing for trial in talk number three on, on the 12th of July. Um, the one point that it is worth flagging though is, is a slight warning. If you don't file an acknowledgement of service, the court can take that failure into account when making costs awards. Um, I personally have never seen, and Charlotte, I don't know if you have um, seen a case where a defendant hasn't filed an acknowledgement of service, no, it's quite hard for me to imagine, a, 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 unless you were filing an acknowledgement of service, it, unless you really don't 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 care about the outcome of it as a defendant, it's very hard for me to imagine a situation where you wouldn't file an AOS. Yeah, I mean, I did when when we were preparing the slides, I did wonder whether one time might be if the claim is just absolutely hopeless. But then equally, I can see a, an argument if the claim is hopeless and somehow it slips through the net because you haven't made representations yeah. and that might be the kind of circumstance of the court saying well why the, why the hell didn't you get involved yeah <laughs> I, I think there are there, there have been sufficient situations where where the permission decision is surprising for that to be quite risky you know i mean i wouldn't necessarily assume i, I might look at a case and think to myself that is totally hopeless but you, you you never know which judge is going to be looking at it you don't know how much time they've got you don't know what else they're looking at and you don't know what their expertise is. I mean, it could be a deputy whose main specialism is is in a completely different sphere. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say that's an unacceptable risk myself. Yeah, I agree, particularly when if the claim is hopeless and the claimant doesn't get permission, you'll get your costs anyway. Usually. Um, so with that in mind, in answer to the question, should we file an acknowledgement of service and summary grounds? Um, my view, and I think Charlotte's, is yes. Um, it's your it's your opportunity to try to effectively knock the claim out at the first hurdle and get it disposed of. Um, it will save you costs over the long run. It will save if you're a, um, involved in a, a, a local authority or the government. Um, it will save significant time, even as a legal advisor, having to liaise with clients, etc. Mm. Um, and as I, I mentioned earlier, usually if if it's a weak case that you're defending, you'll get your costs if you recover it. So that being said, once you've decided that you want to file your acknowledgement of service and summary grounds, how should you go about doing so? And what should you be saying? Well, <clears throat> on one view, and I, I've taken this slightly from um, the Administrative Law Bar Association talk I went to, um, some people's view is that really the only thing you should be putting in, in summary grounds of resistance are knockout blows on procedure. Um, so the, the kind of things that we discussed last time, so checking whether there's been any undue delay in issuing the claim or whether it's it's gone outside limitation, whether it's the, the three month hard stop or the six weeks or the 30 days, depending on the kind of claim that's being brought against you. Checking if the claimant has standing to even bring the claim or the decision is justiciable in itself. 
looking at whether or not your client, the defendant, is actually amenable to judicial review. Um, that, as those of you who were here last time will know, is something we covered quite comprehensively um, last time. So look at the slides for that. If the claimant's got a suitable alternative remedy, that's a pretty good knockout blow because the court generally won't look at the claim if there is a suitable alternative remedy. If the issues are all academic or if no substantial difference would have been made to the outcome of the decision, but for the defendant's actions. Um, these are all good points of procedure that you can raise in your summary grounds of resistance that can potentially knock out the claim at the first hurdle. Um, I'm not so convinced myself that issues around delay and timeliness are necessarily the knockout blow that a lot of people think they are. Um, there's a certain case law that suggests that there is a presumption um, against knocking claims out on the basis of basis of delay if she was in three months but um, some people some people will say say differently um, but ultimately they are they are good procedural points that can be raised raise them if you think they are worth doing just coming back just before we move on just coming back yeah. to the um to the delay point i think to some extent it's always go it's 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 always going to be important to analyze the prejudice that's caused by the delay in filing so, for example, in my specialist area, which is education law, um, a lot of the judicial reviews that I'm involved in will be very young children. So particularly if they're minors um, or if they are vulnerable young people, if they're young people with a disability, um, generally speaking, in my experience, if the claim has not been filed in time and the child or young a, a child obviously can't be expected to make that decision on their own they don't have stat they, they, they don't have capacity to they're completely at the mercy of the adults around them mm -hmm. and a vulnerable young young person with a disability obviously will also be able to make an analogous argument that they they can't really be expected to do it I, I i don't think you could ever say limitation doesn't apply in relation to children or young people that would be a ridiculous position to take but i there is authority to the effect that the court should be slow to bar children and vulnerable people from uh, litigation to enforce their public law rights in circumstances where there isn't really any prejudice to the defendant, apart from that the defendant may have thought they were out of the woods on the claim. So so um, an example of where there might be um, prejudice would be something like um, in, in planning cases or education cases where there's a, a concrete decision that's going to be taken as soon as that three months is up. So in education, it might be admissions. In planning, it might be the commencement of a project. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with you, Matt, that, that limitation in some respects is maybe a bit more forgiving than traditional civil jurisdictions. But still, I think we both say, wouldn't we do not play with fire when it comes to delay? If you can get the claim in time, get it in time. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, certainly planning is, is one area where delay is an issue. Um, but for obvious reasons that you've said that if you've already started to build the development then it's yeah. it is um, yeah yeah i mean i mean i think i think also it's always worth taking the point even if you look at it and think the likelihood is that the court's going to say oh well for various reasons there's not much prejudice it's still a point that you're entitled to take and i would always take it because as we'll probably find out in later editions of this podcast there are there are circumstances where that can be relevant on remedy as well. It can affect the decision whether or not you get a remedy. So it's always worth taking it early. Yeah, and actually remedy is a fair point, isn't it? Because that's the same, the same would apply with a no substantial difference test. If you look at section 31 of the, section 30 of the Senior Courts Act, it's relevant to permission and remedy. So that's a fair point. Um, the one thing I would counsel against, I suppose, is if, if there are an enormous number of procedural knockout points but you've got some particularly good ones not to bury not mm. to bury a good point under a, a mountain of other points but ultimately people have different styles different views um and ultimately everyone does their own their own thing so alongside the knockout procedural blows um the other thing that you can look at in your summary grounds of resistance is the merits of the claim against you now, it's worth bearing in mind the test for permission when you do this, which is that there needs to be an arguable ground for judicial review um, or one with a realistic prospect of success. Um, that is a different test to the test that the court will apply at trial, which is whether there's been an error in the law. So if you can engage with the merits and show that some of the grounds aren't arguable, then again, it's worth doing so. 
um, but you should analyze the merits with the arguably the lower threshold in mind. Uh, but importantly, as a defendant in particular, bear in mind your duty of candor to the court. It's not unlikely, um, particularly if a claimant is legally aided, that there may be gaps in the factual background of claimant's statement of facts and grounds. Um, and it's fair for you, arguably you're required to as a defendant, to flesh that out if you need to. Um, often, although some more hardened defendant lawyers might take a different view, um, it, it's not through the fault of the claimant or their lawyers for trying as to the reasons why there's gaps. Um, often with, with particularly legally aided claimants, you don't have much time at all to issue these claims because yes, you have a three months in theory, but getting a grant of legal aid in the first place can take some time. So these things are often done quite quickly. As a defendant, you are arguably in a better place to know all of the facts because you might have more evidence at your disposal. Flash out the background if you can. Um, when you're analysing the merits of the claim, again, go back to those principles of good decision making that we spoke about at the last talk. Check the powers that your client has whether they've exceeded them, check any delegated authority that a decision maker might have had, arguably make sure the right person has taken the decision, check what they should have taken into account in making the decision, check the reasonableness over all of the decision, check the reasons, etc. Um, and just double check that the, the merits um, aren't strong, basically. Charlotte, do you have any thoughts on um, contents or analysing merits of a claim? I think presentationally it is very valuable to set out the to set out the facts as you understand them to be particularly if there are significant factual differences between you and and the claimant. Um, I think that consistency it doesn't necessarily have to be in the detail that you would um, you would set it out in later and obviously you don't want a situation where you end up at the other end of the process well, firstly, you don't want to expend huge amounts of resources on, on the permission stage if you can do it in a relatively concise way that takes everything in. And secondly, you don't want that situation where at the other end you're drafting your skelly and you think this skelly is basically going to be pretty much the same as the uh, original summary of grounds of resistance. Um, but I do think, again, it's it's really just about not assuming that a judge who is looking at a whole stack of permission applications on the papers where you don't necessarily know what kind of claims your claim is sandwiched in between. Um, it's just about not assuming that the judge is going to glean what you want them to glean from the from the claim and a very short, very short response. If you're doing what, what I would say is if you're doing a summary, a summary grounds of resistance and an AOS, it's worth doing it well, not necessarily lengthily, but it's worth doing it well. Yeah, that's a fair point. In terms of the contents, then we've we've discussed this. Um, already, but the one thing I would flag up, um, or two things I would flag up, check the CPR because at the moment in particular the rules around judicial review seem to be um, changing quite quickly. We had a, a fair number of changes come in in the back end of 2021, um, so if you haven't dealt with these claims in a while it's worth reminding yourself of the provisions of the CPR. Um, one of the key points now, or well, arguably always has been, but it's now in a, in a statutory basis under the CPR is that your details, your, your summary grounds of resistance need to be as concise as possible and they now must not exceed 30 pages unless the court has given permission um, and if you want the court's permission then the emphasis is on you as a defendant to make a formal application. Um, there was when when these provisions were put into the CPR um, a lot of a lot of noise from the judiciary about the fact that, that summary grounds were becoming very lengthy um, mm. There's not necessarily any need for them to be lengthy. But certainly, in the vast majority of cases, they will be shorter than 30 pages, I would hope. Yeah, and I think the other thing to bear in mind is, at permission stage, the question is, is there an arguable claim? Hmm. And it can be very tempting to go to town on the claim, particularly if you feel you've got a lot of material to work with as a defendant. And the thing to bear in mind is, almost the more you argue about the claim, the more arguable the claim starts to look. And so that there has to be a balance between, on the one hand, fleshing out everything that you're saying, um, and on the other hand, not putting in effectively a full rebuttal of everything, which may lead the judge to look at it and think, well, it looks like this is arguable. 
you know, it, it obviously depends on the issues at stake, but there's a lot of value in being as concise as possible. Yeah, defendants put in 30 grams of some 30 pages of summary grounds. It can't be that large. But... <laughs> Quite. <laughs> Quite. Um, the other thing to think about, and it's not something that should be being done routinely, I would suggest, is if a claim is truly hopeless, the, the chest of a, a claim is bound to fail, then a defendant can consider asking the court to certify the application for judicial review as totally without merit. Um, the key benefit of that is that it precludes the claimant from uh, requesting an oral renewal hearing mm. of permission. Um, I, I, I say you shouldn't be routinely doing them. I'm often reluctant to do them. Um, I had a had a permission hearing on Friday, actually, in, a, in, a, in an appeal, um, and it was the first time in a long while that I had genuinely thought a claim was totally without merit. Um, and by way of example, um, I was for the defendant, which was a, which was a regulator, the appellant <clears throat> had issued an appeal against uh, a cost order and had relied on practice direction 46, which is about wasted costs against legal representatives. However, he didn't have legal representatives when the order was made and the judge did not make a wasted costs order. So in an appeal saying that the judge effectively was, was completely wrong in how he dealt with a wasted costs order when no wasted costs order had been made, I thought that was a fair time to set it. The application was totally without merit. And thankfully, the judge agreed with it. Um, but it is worth doing, as I say, it precludes an oral renewal hearing. And if you've got a really vexatious claimant, if you have two or more certifications of totally without merit, then you're in the realms of when you can start to look for a, a civil restraint order. Um, those of you who dealt with them will know that you have to have at least two TMW findings before you can actually ask for a, a limited civil restraint order in the first place. Finally then, um, or, or penultimately, is directions. Often defend, defendants don't seek directions um, in summary grounds of resistance and acknowledgement of services. Um, I think it's always a good, good thing to bear in mind. Um, does your case, for instance, as Charlotte has alluded to, the judges in the admin court deal with a, a vast array of different things, ranging from immigration to education, some deal with planning, um, some deal with commercial regulatory work. Does your case need a judge with a particular knowledge basis? If it does, you're entitled to ask for it. Um, do you as a defendant want anonymity? Do you want things dealt with particularly quickly? Um, in which case you can, you can make directions. Obviously directions are going to be completely case specific, so I'm, I'm not going to go into too many examples, but it's just worth flagging up the fact that you can ask for directions and if you want to, you should do so. And lastly then, um, don't be surprised once you've put in your summary grounds of resistance, if a reply document from the claimant comes winging its way towards you, um, there's no provision in the civil procedure rules for a claimant to be allowed to file a reply. Some claimants ask for a direction that they can file a reply, but not, not that often. Um, just be aware that the court will usually take it into account when it considers permission. Um, Again, rarely, I've seen it a couple of times, and I've done it myself a couple of times. If a, if a claimant puts in a reply that either you think does a good job of rebutting what you've said or makes factual errors or legal errors, then there's no harm in you putting in as a defendant a response to a reply. But just bear in mind that the, the court is not going to be overly thrilled when it's used to two documents upon which to make a permission decision to then have to look through four. Um, so it's worth only really putting a response into a reply if it's actually going to really assist the court. Yeah, I think I think the thing that I always think about in terms of reply is, um, is whoever I'm representing, the question for me is always, do I actually need to correct something hmm. or clarify something? Or am I just frustrated by what they've said because in the context of what I've previously said, it seems ridiculous? If it's the latter, it's worth considering whether a reply is really necessary, because as Matt, as Matt says, again, you have to go back to what is a permission decision. A permission decision is a thing that is undertaken by a judge who's got a massive stack of papers to go through and who will be looking at a range of different cases, some of which will be relatively limited in their effect on people, but still important. And some of which will be things like this person is going to be beheaded if they are sent back to their home country this evening or tomorrow. So. And I come back to this in the context of urgent consideration, uh, particularly in a minute. 
Um, but it's it's really worth bearing in mind the practicalities of what the judge has to do. And if you can ensure that what's before them from you is ideally in one document and as concise as possible, that will help you. That will help you in terms of in terms of how the judge feels about the application for permission. Yeah, so that's a really, really good point. The final thing, I suppose, I, I didn't put on the slides, but it's worth mentioning, is that you do have a right to file evidence alongside your summary grounds of resistance as well. I don't think the court necessarily encourages it, but if you need to, there's no reason why you can't. Um, but now then, Charlotte, as you've, you've foreshadowed, yeah. urgent consideration, I'll hand over to you. Um, yeah. Let me know when you want me to move forward with the slides. Lovely. Um, before, before I move on to urgent consideration, one more point about replies, which is that, that because the rules don't make any provision for one, it's important to bear in mind if you are going to make a, to, 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 to draft a reply, get it in quickly, because once, um, once the application for, for permission is in and the AOS and summary grounds are in, um, and anything that the claimant, at that point, the court can determine the application for permission at any point. They could do it five minutes after they've got those documents. In practice, as we know, they probably won't. But just bear in mind, the court will not wait for further replies. It doesn't have to wait for replies. It will proceed on the basis of what it's got as and when it comes to that, to, 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 to those documents. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about urgent consideration. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So. Um, so far as judicial review proceedings are concerned, it's an emergency jurisdiction. And I, I guess you could say that by definition, any application for judicial review is going to have a level of urgency. Um, and in most cases, you're going to be able to make for a claimant a very good argument as to why an application for urgent consideration uh, needs to be granted. So a claimant is always going to be able to say, I really need this to be determined quickly. And that's probably going to be true. That's not what urgent consideration is for. Urgent consideration is for the minority of very, very urgent cases where there is going to be a genuine, I mean, the, 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 the judicial review um, guide that the administrative court puts out says a genuine need for the application to be considered urgently. It's going to need to be pretty striking. So, for example, there might be cases where a claimant is seeking an interim order of some kind, uh, preventing a defendant from doing something which will result in irreversible consequences, which will prejudice the, um, the, the claimant. Or they might be saying that the defendant has to do something very quickly. So that's a situation where urgent consideration might be required. Um, there might be other circumstances where there are very good reasons to apply for abridgment of time for service of the acknowledgement of service and so on. But it's really important to distinguish between urgent consideration cases, those very, very important cases where the claimant is going to be irrevocably prejudiced if there isn't very, very swift consideration of their application for permission, and judicial review cases generally where the claimant, it's obviously desirable that matters should be resolved as quickly as possible, there may be a case for expedition. So in my field of education law, there's nearly always a case for expedition because the cases are going to involve children and young people who, who urgently require something in relation to, to their education. But those cases will not necessarily give rise to a need for urgent consideration. So a very good example, I think, is that um, a couple of years ago, I was involved in a case involving a child who was not receiving uh, the special educational provision that they needed. And that child had a life limiting condition, which meant that they were very sadly unlikely to live beyond their teens. And they were, I think, 12 or 13 at the time that we made the application. Um, and we considered that that was a good basis for an application for urgent consideration. It was certainly one of the most urgent cases that you would see in an education context uh, because the child urgently needed um, the provision that he wasn't getting in order to slow the consequences of his, of his condition. And uh, we, we did not get urgent consideration. We, in fact, got a bit of a a bit of a flea in our ear from the administrative course about the fact that we had applied for urgent consideration. In most cases, it's likely that what you will need to do, rather than making a separate application for urgent for urgent consideration, um, it's likely that what you what, what's going to be more appropriate for the claimant is going to be to make an application on Form N244 uh, and to provide a cover letter explaining that there's a need for expedition. Uh, and setting out the timescale for consideration. And so I think if you as a defendant get an application for urgent consideration, 
it's always going to be valid to scrutinize. Well, first, you've got to look at it quickly. It's always going to be valid to scrutinize it and just consider whether the claimant has really made out urgent consideration as opposed to perhaps a need for more expedition than usual, or whether actually, yes, everybody sympathises with the need to get these things resolved as quickly as possible, but it's no more or less important than anything else in the administrative court's normal list. So you are entitled, as we, we've said on the slide, you, you'll be served with the urgent application, or you should be, unless it's very, very urgent indeed. Um, you have the right to make representations, and you are absolutely entitled as a defendant to try to persuade the court that it's not a case for urgent consideration. And I don't know about you, Matt, I think actually a lot of the time a defendant will be pushing at an open door in relation to that. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, certainly I've had, a, had cases in the community care context um, where we've issued out of hours application and had a, had a telephone hearing with a high court judge at 10 o'clock at night for the defendant to turn up and say, well, this isn't an urgent consideration matter. You don't need to consider it now. The young person's not got a home or a bed to go to tonight, but nonetheless, it's not urgent. Um, and the court has agreed with them and said, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll list it for a hearing in two days' time. Um, so, yeah, you are often pushing an open door. The other thing that I've noticed recently is because of the, the climate, there's a, a bit of an issue at the moment with urgent consideration applications, and they've been quite high profile cases recently where the court's been exercising its hammered jurisdiction to call representatives in and tell them off basically for, for issuing urgent applications unnecessarily. Some claimants now have been issuing judicial reviews and asking for them to be dealt with as rolled up hearings. Yeah. So for those of you on the, the call who don't know what that means, it's where the court deals with permission and the merits of the judicial review all in one. So you tend to get a hearing come in relatively quickly, you turn up, you treat it as a judicial review final hearing, but the court also determines permission. Um, yeah. That that can also be another quite effective way for a claimant to try and get things dealt with urgently. Yeah. Um, and as a defendant, you're almost stuck with that really. There's not an awful lot you can do about it. Yeah. I'm just going to say something very quickly about applications for interim relief because applications for urgent consideration and interim relief often go together. So yeah. the most the most typical forms of interim relief sought by claimants will be um interim injunctions either stopping you as the defendant from doing something uh, or requiring you to do something. Um, generally speaking, that application will be made in the claim form. It can be made at any stage of the proceedings, but in the vast majority of cases I've seen, it's it's been asked for in the um, claim form. There can be cases where an application might be made before starting judicial review proceedings, but that is that is pretty unusual, at least in my field, it's pretty unusual. Uh, and it will only be done where the court considers that it's urgent, the matter is urgent, or it's otherwise necessary to do so in the interests of justice. Um, in terms of the criteria for deciding applications for interim relief, um, it's, it's very similar actually to the general injunctions jurisdiction. Uh, so the judge will consider whether there is a real issue to be tried, and whether the balance of convenience lies in favour of granting the interim order. So it's the it's that typical American cyanamid balancing test, the harm that would be caused to the claimant if the interim relief is not granted, um, and the claim later succeeds against the harm to the defendant or any or any third parties in the public interest that would be caused if interim relief is granted and the claim later fails. Um, it obviously will depend on the circumstances, but generally speaking, there's a strong urge, I think, particularly in the administrative court, to maintain the status quo unless you can see uh, that very clear prejudice. So again, taking an example from my main field of practice, um, there are frequently cases where, for example, you might have a school that is refusing to admit a child in circumstances where there is a legal duty um, upon the school to admit the child. And generally speaking, there is a lack of appetite to make an interim order requiring the school to admit the child pending the outcome, because obviously in the event that the school were to succeed in its, uh, or, 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 you know, the school were to be, it was to be found that the school didn't have to admit the child, then the upset caused to the child as well as the difficulties for the school would be considerable. Um, and so that's an example of a situation where the status quo is difficult for the claimant, but nevertheless, the likelihood is that the status quo will be maintained. I think it's also one one thing to add on interim relief, Charlotte, if I may, is um, defendants will be familiar, I suspect, with the American cyanamid 
principles from, from civil work that they might be involved with. Um, within the civil field, obviously, cross undertakings and damages um, are quite useful way as a defendant to try to um, effectively protect yourself against interim injunctions. Um, that doesn't necessarily work so much in the admin court. There's a case called the Congo um, that says that the generally the emphasis is against awarding cross undertakings and damages um, against claimants where interim applications are made in the admin court. So um, one thing I would say is if you're if you take a, a, a civil or a commercial view of it, um, perhaps we'll lessen that slightly in the yeah. admin court because you might not get the, the damages you're thinking. No, I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, the only other thing I would say in relation to interim relief is that generally speaking, in the cases I've done where a claimant is seeking interim relief, um, they are much more likely to get an order expediting the case than they are to get an order requiring the defendant to do or refrain from doing something pending the outcome of the proceedings. So that the application might be interim relief, the most likely outcome in many cases will be um, expedition of the claim. Um, so moving on to permission decisions, um, we've talked about we've talked about this briefly, I think, already um, the test for permission. Uh, so the papers go before a judge. The judge makes the decision, generally speaking, on the papers. Um, most most permission decisions are made on the papers, although we'll see that there are some circumstances where a judge will um, order an oral hearing to decide permission. Um, the test is that there is an arguable ground for judicial review with a realistic prospect of success and no discretionary bars to permission. Um, although at the same time, Mass, I suppose that there might, as we've discussed before, there might be potential discretionary bars to permission, like, for example, delay, breach of limitation, um, a question mark over whether there would be any different outcome um, yeah. if the, if, 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 if the uh, decision making had been approached differently. Um, and it is sometimes sometimes those will be fatal to permission, but in on other occasions the judge might uh, typically the judge might note it make make note of those in their decision on permission and say this is obviously something that the judge who hears the substantive hearing may pick up if if we get to remedy. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the judge won't won't bar you won't bar you in terms of refusing permission, but they may say be aware that this may mean you don't get a remedy at the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, a number of potential outcomes um, in terms of permission. So if we just go, thanks. Um, so the first um, potential, um, the, fir the, the first possible outcome is that permission is granted. And we're going to talk in the next webinar about what happens when you uh, are granted permission. The second outcome is that permission gets refused. And if permission is refused on the papers, um, we'll talk about um, refusals um, of claims totally without merit in a minute. But if, the, if permission gets refused without a finding that the claim is totally without merit, then the claimant can seek oral renewal um, by way of a hearing as long as they make that application within seven days. Um, if permission is refused, generally speaking, the claimant will be required to pay the defendant's costs of preparing the AOS and SGR. So those are the two, those are probably the most the most common outcomes, I would say, fairly binary, permission gets granted, permission gets refused, but there are other options. So if we go to the next slide, um, another possibility is that the permission gets refused and the claim gets certified as totally without merit. And the main consequence of this, as Matt's already said previously, is that it means that the claimant can't seek an oral renewal hearing, they're going to have to appeal to the Court of Appeal. And obviously, um, in order to appeal to the Court of Appeal, you've got to satisfy them that there is a point of general public importance and you've got to otherwise get them interested in it. So it makes it much harder for the claimant to um, challenge uh, that decision. Um, totally without merit is relatively rare, isn't it, Matt? I've, I've not seen very many of those. No. Um, no. Um, so, and, and, and to be honest, if, what, what I would say is, um, it is, as Matt said, worth if you think the claim really is totally laughable when you're responding to it it is worth saying either either just saying we think this claim is totally without merit or saying it is bound to fail and in that way inviting the court to make that decision um there might be a part sorry go on. no I was, I was i was just nodding i was agreeing with you charlotte <laughs> um and then the other option is that you might get 
uh, permission on some of your grounds or not, uh, but not others. So a park grant of permission, and that's not uncommon that a judge will look at your grounds and effectively say, well, you know, you've got 15 grounds here. And I think that the ones that you need permission on are these three. I'm not interested in the other seven. And sometimes you you look at it, you know, as a claimant, they you might look at it and say, well, I can see why the judge made that decision. And sometimes it's kind of administrative, um, you know, sort of exercise. Do you really need 15 when you could have three? From a defendant's point of view, this is why it's very much worth going through the grounds, particularly if there are lots of them. It's worth just flagging each of the grounds in your um, in your uh, summary grounds of resistance. And just giving reasons because because chipping away at them in that way can can be very effective, and they don't necessarily all stand or fall together. Um, permission might be adjourned to an oral hearing on notice. This is something that has happened occasionally. Um, it's something that perhaps you're more inviting to happen as parties if you're both sort of effectively arguing with each other via lots of replies. But that's another reason just to think about how many replies you actually need. But it can be the case sometimes that the judge says, well, I'm interested in this. I'm not persuaded it should get permission. I'm going to ask everybody to turn up because I've got some questions and I think we need to argue it out. I'm not satisfied on the papers before me uh, that I can make a decision. Um, the last two potential options are permission adjourned to a rolled up hearing. So a rolled up hearing would be where the judge says, I think the best way to deal with this case is going to be for it to go before um, to go before a judge with directions for effectively a substantive hearing. And that judge will decide both whether or not permission will be granted. And uh, if permission is granted, they will make a decision on the substantive merits of it and they will make a decision on remedy. I mean, a rolled up hearing, it can be very frustrating, can't it, Matt? Because it means that all of the parties are going into it without really knowing exactly what what you're dealing with or what the outcome will be so in some ways it's the worst of all worlds yeah plus you then have the cost of preparing a skeleton exactly. argument putting in evidence without really potentially in claims that are not going to get permission yeah yeah exactly um and then finally the applicate that the order might be that the application for permission should be resubmitted i have to admit i've never seen that have you had that happen matt no um and i <clears throat> i'm not Circumstances in which that would happen either, because unless you're barring a completely I don't know, defective form or something, um, I, I just can't see the circumstances in which you would need to have it resubmitted. Yeah. I have had a case before um, where the court has effectively adjourned the issue of permission with an order saying this case is ridiculous you need to speak to the defendant and yeah um, discuss what's going on because it was it was such a such a clear breach that yeah the court couldn't really remedy it was to do with with social care provision um and the court effectively said come back to us within six months once you've had a chance to speak and try to resolve things mm. um so whether whether that would be akin to having to res resubmit for permission i don't know um, yeah, I mean, there are. So a good example would be you do occasionally get judicial reviews that arise. So, for example, in my field, a good example might be there is a dispute about which local authority is responsible for securing provision for a particular child. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a dispute about where that child normally normally lives or who's responsible. And that's the kind of case where if that ultimately results in one local authority JRing another, which is a which is a possible outcome in that situation, if there's no other way to break the deadlock, I think it's it's very likely that at some stage, and it could well be at the permission stage, you will get the judge saying, "This is ridiculous. You need to go and sort this out." Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there is that mechanism, I suppose, for a judge for a judge just to just to say, "No, you know, please please just go away and sort this out." And if you really can't sort it out, come back. But it is unusual, generally speaking, the judge would just decide permission one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, like you say, the, the most common outcome is either a yes or no, right? You don't need... Exactly. You know, yeah. the, the fact that we're sitting here saying that there are seven potential decisions, I know. Um, the reality is usually there are two. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. In, in the vast majority of cases, it will be decided on the papers. Um, OK, and then finally, I just want to talk about oral renewal hearings. 
Um, so as a defendant, you don't need to attend unless you're ordered to. And sometimes the judge might order you to. The judge might think it's it's helpful for you to come. You can attend. There's no problem with you attending. And as, as, as Matt said in this slide, it might be sensible to attend just to make sure that if anything, you know, if any, if anything perhaps slightly contentious or wild is 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 submitted in the hearing, you're there to rebut it and to deal with it. Um, the thing to bear in mind is that as a defendant, it will be difficult to get your costs if you're not ordered to attend, because the admin court's view, I think, is really that it's the claimant who needs to turn up to explain why there's an arguable case. So, so it's it's worth bearing that in mind. I think probably many defendants will take the view that they would rather take the cost hit on the chin to be able to turn up and have a little bit of control over the outcome. Um, but but do be aware that if you do that, the likelihood is that you're not going to get your costs back. Um, on the other hand, it might make the difference between you being embroiled in costly judicial review proceedings that goes with substantive hearing versus that being the end of it. Um, the other thing is that these hearings tend to be very short. Um, they're normally for about 30 minutes, and that includes judgment. And so it's not going to be a kind of ceremonial hearing where somebody opens the whole of the case and then there's protracted arguments on it. The judge is literally trying to work out is the claim arguable. Yeah, and as as someone uh... I used to be an employed barrister and I um, was on the phone to a defendant solicitor at one point who um, rather lovingly described an oral renewal hearing as a quick and dirty opportunity to try to argue the case. And I think that's absolutely right. You, you stand up as a claimant, you make almost bullet point arguments and hope to hope to the judges with you. Yeah. Um, and certainly from a defendant perspective, I have seen cases where um, turn up for the defendant the, the claimant makes their arguments um, and the, the court just says, well, I don't need to hear from you just a while for the, for the defendant because they know what they're doing, um, which I think is the best the best outcome you can get from those kind of hearings. Really. Thank you ever so much, everyone, for joining. Um, talk number three is on the 12th of July um, and hopefully you look forward to seeing some of you there. Lovely.